All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. My name is Stephen Tirana. I'm here with my colleague, Ray Vargas. We're lead technologist at Booz Allen Hamilton. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how to decouple microservice development teams with ephemeral application environments on OpenShift. Uh, so we're going to talk about what are microservices, just a level set. We're going to dive into the pros and cons of some of the software development challenges that arise with microservices. Uh, we'll talk through Booz Allen's solution to some of these problems. We'll dive into what do we mean by ephemeral application environments, do a demo live, so everyone cross your fingers for me. Uh, then we're going to talk about keys to success, and then uh, next steps in using Helm. Yeah, so we're, we're all pretty familiar with, with the monolith, right? Um, you've got this monolithic giant application. You've got all of your business logic in that one thing, and it's all tightly coupled, right? So when one developer goes in, makes a change, he has the potential to you know, affect the, the, the application as a whole, right? So we've seen an industry shift from something that looks like this to something supposedly easier that looks like this, right? So it's a little more different, right? You're breaking down your monolith into its specific domain components, and then teams uh, surround each individual uh, domain and write an application that you know, focuses on that one particular domain. So you know, following best uh, practices for these microservices, you have individual services, each one does one thing, each one has its own data store, uh, and it works that way. And then oftentimes what you're going to see is that these uh, individual services have these tightly uh, complex uh, communication chains between each one of them. So one service might call another service, which may call two more. Um, oftentimes in the federal space, what you see is that uh, individual vendors are responsible for a different aspect of the overall application. So they get their particular domain of microservices, and that's it. So that makes it a little challenging when you've got these uh, different vendors that are all geographically dispersed into really focusing on, on you know, something like writing integration tests where if I want to write a good integration test, I need to have you know, complete knowledge of the whole system. And if I'm only having complete knowledge of my individual portion of the system, that gets a little complex. And for each of these different microservices, you've got unique development teams that all need to be doing the DevSecOps best practices that we talk about all the time. You need to be integrating security into every aspect of your software development lifecycle. So this means things like scanning your application dependencies, doing container image scanning, doing uh, penetration testing, doing static code analysis, all of these aspects of integrating security into the whole process so that we don't spend all this time developing these features. And then at the end, you know, we pass it to the security team. So now instead of throwing it over to the ops wall, We've been throwing it over the security wall. So part of DevSecOps is integrating them into the process from the start. And this is all in addition to the rest of the kinds of automated testing that we've been talking about for the last 15 years. So that's you know, integration testing, functional testing. Uh, and the point here is that it's very challenging for organizations uh, and government agencies when you've got these microservice teams you don't want each individual team developing their own process where you don't have insight into exactly how software development is happening throughout your organization. So some of the challenges that get associated with this are, Ray can talk about it, yes. being the developer side of the, the talk here. So as a developer, you're <laughs> contributing your portion of the app, your microservice code, to this one shared pipeline. But you're sharing this pipeline with you know, tens of teams, potentially, on your microservices. And if you're at the enterprise, I mean, it's hundreds of services that, that make up one single application, right? So what happens if someone inevitably pushes a bug to your dev environment? Then you potentially break dev for a number of different teams. And so what happens then? Like, your teams are stuck until that's either reverted, and that has its own pains, or, the, or, or it's fixed, right? But again, you've got these microservices that are so decoupled that, or so dispersed, rather, that it's difficult to really pin down the root cause of what broke dev. So, like we talked about earlier, there's this complex dependency chains between your microservices. You've got teams from different vendors that are geographically dispersed. They might be in different time zones. When dev breaks, this big complicated pipeline breaks down too. So if your integrated environment is broken for one team and you don't have sufficiently decoupled teams, that means that your entire software development process is blocked for your entire organization until you're able to resolve that bug. So that's the problem that we're going to be talking about one way to solve today. And our solution to this at Booz Allen is called the Solutions Delivery Platform. It's our internal investment around DevSecOps and how to be able to build an organizational pipeline with organizational governance and plug-and-play functionality so you can abstract this into one location for your entire 
uh, organization. If you're interested more in how this gets implemented, uh, we have a talk at 3 o'clock today to go into the weeds around the pipeline framework. Today we're going to show a specific use case of that, which is the ephemeral application environments. Um, so let's see a demo. I don't see you all crossing your fingers for me, so. Uh, all right. All right, so we have OpenShift currently deployed. This is on AWS. We have our production environment. Ray can walk through the application and what's currently in production. So I've got this simple app here, right? So it's just a bootstrap app. I can switch over to the caps and see a nice list of, of the roster and some selected stats. That's great. So now there's another team playing in the playoffs. So as a developer, I'm implementing that new feature. I want a list of the Vegas Golden Knights. So I've done all my local development. I've written all of my tests. Everything's good to go. I'm ready to deploy. But again, in the context of these distributed services, I don't have the full picture. I, I don't have the resources to stand up each individual service and run locally, right? So I'll go ahead and I'll just open a pull request for my new feature. So what if instead of all of us sharing the development environment, every pull request is able to have a unique copy of the code running in production with just your change for your feature? So rather than all of us deploying to dev at the same time, because of infrastructure as code and containerization, we're able to use tools like Helm and OpenShift to create on-demand environments for a pull request, taking known good code, the code that's in production, uh, and creating a copy of that with your change. Uh, so Ray opened his PR. You can't merge it till the test pass. Uh, that's important. Don't break the build for your, your coworkers. Uh, when he opens that PR, that's going to kick off a pull request job in Jenkins. Uh, the blue ocean view is more aesthetically pleasing. Uh, so let's navigate to that. So now it's going to kick off all those testing that we saw earlier. So this is going to do static code analysis with SonarCube. We're going to build our container image, do some container image scanning. Uh, then we're going to deploy an ephemeral application environment in OpenShift based on the prod configuration and substitute out our version of the service for this pull request. Um, so it's going to take a second to build this pull request, or this Docker image, excuse me. Um, so while that is building, we can look at OpenShift so you know that I am not pulling a fast one on you. Uh, so the ephemeral environment has not been created yet. In Blue Ocean. after it finishes building this image, it's going to just scan it. Uh, in this demo, we're using TwistLock, but because of the way this pipeline framework has been built, all of the tools that you're seeing today are plug and play. If you had a different tool that did container image scanning, you'd be able to swap that out. Um, so here it is creating the ephemeral application environment with Helm. Uh, it's going to sleep. So full disclaimer, Helm right now has a dash dash wait flag that lets you wait for everything to be done. The OpenShift API objects are not yet integrated into that. So while we figure out a way to get past that. It's sleeping for 45 seconds while it stands it up. But if we come back over to OpenShift, we see that a new project has been provisioned. It says the name of the repository that this pull request is for, it says the PR number, and then the Jenkins build number. So then within this project, it's going to take our, our configuration and deploy all of the resources. So we've got our front end written in Vue, our back end API written in Spring Boot, uh, and then a Postgres container. Uh, so the production environment is currently using a RDS Postgres. In our ephemeral application environment, we don't, we're not trying to do uh, you know, load testing in this environment. We're trying to test the integration points between our applications and different microservices. So we deploy a containerized version of the database because that's sufficient for us to be able to test these touch points uh, between our application and its database. Uh, so while this is coming up, uh, the sleep should end in a second. So now it kicked off in parallel the different kinds of testing that we're going to do against this environment. So there's accessibility testing, so that's 508 compliance. There's functional testing, and depending on your framework, that could be different things, uh, Protractor, uh, Nightwatch, Selenium. Uh, and then there's penetration testing through all OWASP Zap. Again, all of these tools are plug and play, and we can talk more about that at 3 o'clock today. And then to be able to show what's going on in this ephemeral environment, we added an exploratory testing. Uh, part of the pipeline. So this will actually give me the URL that got provisioned for this environment. Uh, hoping the Wi-Fi cooperates with me. Seems like it is. Come over to OpenShift and see all the pods are running. Uh, so now we have a fully ephemeral version of this application with all of its dependencies. We can see in the upper right that the feature Ray has been working on, adding the Vegas Golden Knights to the website, has been added. Uh, 
uh, we can click at the ca uh, on the CAPS tab, oh. and it's going to load the database from, so this is our Postgres that we deployed within OpenShift, and now we have our Vegas Golden Knights, and it's got that database, that uh, yeah. data set. And so we've done this completely independently of the production build here, right? So refresh, and you can see that nothing has changed on this one. It's a completely separate environment for you to, to explore and play with. Yep. So now that penetration testing is still going on, uh, we have sufficiently tested exploratorily, if that's a word. So I can click proceed. When penetration, penetration testing is complete, now that I've said I'm done with my exploratory testing, uh, it's going to get rid of this ephemeral environment. Uh, we'll be able to go to OpenShift and see that being deleted. Uh, and then we'll talk about like, how do you actually go about doing this for your application. Um, waiting for Zap to finish up here. So that's going to finish. So the, the key points here, again, to summarize, when you have a static integrated environment and you've got these geographically diverse teams from multiple vendors, communication gets much harder. The bandwidth required to do all of the integration testing and defining API contracts, all best practices that you should be doing, but I've seen the real world and I've seen that that doesn't always happen to the degree, degree that we would like it to. So ephemeral application environments give you a way to create not mocks, an actual version of production with your change in it. So now that this is complete, if I go back to OpenShift, everything's being deleted. If I come back to the projects list, I can see that that environment is being marked for deletion. Um, and we'll be able to merge this pull request as soon as Jenkins tells GitHub that this job is complete. Come back here. Yeah, it did. Two successful checks. It's out of date with master because I updated a pull request. Um, so we'll do that again. Uh, while this is happening, we're going to merge that pull request. The master was out of sync because I edited a readme to test it. Live demos are fun. <laughs> so while that's running one more time, we're going to talk about what are the keys to success for doing this. Um, so back to our deck. Yeah, so, so in order for this to really work, you need your application developers and your DevOps engineers really working side by side. And that's something that we heard this morning as well. Right, this is a, a culture change where everyone needs to work in tandem. So one thing that we needed to do was, the auto, uh, was to automate the data scene. So that database that we saw for the ephemeral environment was created for that particular environment, right? So we need a way to take either all of your data or more likely a subset of that data for every application that you depend on, right, for, for this particular environment. So you can do that a number of different ways. Uh, you can do it through the application itself so Spring Boot supports loading different database schemas, uh, ingesting different datas. You can do it through database images that are already pre-populated. So you can extend on the OpenShift Postgres image to import that data um, as it comes up. You can create an init container that does the database seeding for you. So there are, there are a number of different ways that you can accomplish this. You need everything to be Dockerized, right? You need to containerize all of your applications. This is great for your developers to do local development. So it's easy to just spin up an updated version of your container with your application, uh, or a number of different applications. It speeds up the development, it reduces your cost, right? Uh, speed of environment provisioning, so on and so forth through the use of, of things like Docker caching. Uh, you need to version your dependency. So every container that's built through this pipeline is versioned with the specific commit SHA. So you can see exactly which version of the application was running at any particular point in time. Uh, so it's easy to roll back, it's easy to find where exactly things went wrong. Uh, and you, through, through the use of things like Redmine and Jira and the API, you can automate the release notes by integrating that API with, with OpenShift. And then lastly, you need to have your infrastructure as code, right? So Steve mentioned Helm. This helps with uh, consistently automating and recreating the environment that you're testing in. So you can um, realistically mimic prod, reliably uh, reproduce prod, when you're doing this ephemeral checks, these ephemeral, uh, ephemeral testing. And it helps with uh, things like rollback and uh, disaster recovery. Okay, and a point I want to stress on the side, this slide is how much this helps you with local development. I think that you know, being able to use containerization locally on your laptop to test all of these things is super important because that is how your application is going to get run on production. Uh, being able to just spin up a version of this application means that you know that it is going to work when you know, it gets deployed through the pipeline to your environment. 
uh, when we talk on like large scale implementations of microservice development where I've got thousands of microservices, we're going to talk in a little bit about what you can do about that. Uh, it would still be possible to do this, maybe not on your laptop, but it would be very expensive. So with all of this infrastructure as code and automation, you're able to test exactly what you would in your real environment on your laptop. And that gives you better insight into what your options are from an application development perspective on your container orchestration platform to be able to find patterns that you typically wouldn't be able to with just code, right? So using things like Istio for your API management and logging and you know, rate limiting and all of those great patterns that we could take advantage of on the platform side, uh, being able to use Kubernetes or OpenShift through Minishift locally gives you insight into what's available out there as an application developer. Um, so how, how did we actually do this? Uh, so there's Helm. Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, I like to think of it essentially as a templating engine that sits on top of these really ugly YAML files that we talk about all the time. Um, so the too long, didn't read. It lets you make your YAML files more parameter parameterizable. Um, so the pipeline, in our case, adds a flag on the fly to our values file. So in Helm, we create these templates. We say, grab this value from this values file. Um, Jenkins inserts a flag into that values file that says, we want to deploy this version in an ephemeral environment. So then you can use if statements in your YAML to do different things based upon whether or not this flag is set. So for instance, in production, we have a service definition that when that flag is not set, points to an external name. So it says, go talk to this RDS Postgres. When the ephemeral flag is set, it deploys a containerized version of Postgres and sets up the service to be a load balancer for your pods. Um, so you're able to do this conditional flow of what exact resources are being deployed to my environment based on these, these flags. Um, so what are, the, what are the next steps and how does this scale? Um, so what we demoed today is uh, you know, implementation of full staging. We took everything in production, and I'll actually show you the Helm charts in a bit, time permitting. Um, we deployed a full copy of that application, but if I had hundreds of thousands of microservices, that's, while possible, probably very expensive to recreate on the fly for n number of PRs open at a time. So what you can do instead is do something called partial staging, which is where you deploy just your version of the microservice and the change, and then you use uh, you know, proxying to the production version of the actual microservices with read-only accounts. So rather than deploying a full copy of everything in my application environment, I just deploy my change and then I you know, rely on the actual production instances and send traffic to them. Um, connections to databases should be read-only. Uh, this is a you know, equally valid but more dangerous, if you will, implementation because if you mess up the permissions on this database, you might break production. Um, so with great power comes great responsibility. Um, so there's a lot of options out there. I've seen tools like Telepresence are exciting to me. Telepresence is a tool that lets you proxy to remote clusters. So locally, if I had this huge microservice ecosystem, I could deploy just my microservice and have my fast feed feedback loops of developing locally and then use a tool like Telepresence to proxy to the actual deployed versions of these services. Um, so let's see if that PR job is stuck at the exploratory testing button yet. And we'll actually merge that PR in. Um, it is perfect. So here we'll see a build go away. As soon as Jenkins finishes this, we'll be able to merge that pull request. I'm always scared relying on Jenkins <laughs> to be, cooperate with me. Uh, so merge pull request. So the in a you know, not a demo environment, you would also have required code reviews. And this helps you get around the separation of duties requirement that comes up a lot with how to do DevOps in the federal space. So the concern is that as a rogue actor developer, I could make a change and without review, just deploy it to production. Um, requiring code reviews means someone else has to look at it. You ha uh, using the techniques from the solutions delivery platform that we'll talk about later today, I can say, you don't have a Jenkins file in your repository. You can't just go into your repo, comment out all the required gates and say, I want to deploy to production. Um, and now with ephemeral environments, you're able to completely decouple yourself from all of the other development teams. So now that this is merged, it's going to kick off the master branch. Cool, it already did, I believe. 
so we can go to Jenkins, come back to the production. This will be gone. Yep, good. Um, I'm always worried about caching too on, on front end things. Cool, so now this is our production environment. The feature that we tested in our femoral application environment has been deployed to production. Um, the data has been seeded and we're able to get the Knights roster out of our RDS instance in Postgres. Um, the assumption there was that the data migration uh, had already taken place, uh, either through the pipeline or not through the pipeline. Again, there's different techniques around that and backwards compatibility and all. Data is the hardest part of any <laughs> DevOps solution, in my opinion. Um, so that's it. Does anyone have any questions? I can dive into like the Helm charts and show you what those look like, um, but I want to open it up to questions. Where does the environment's name come from, the environment's name? So every project key gets randomly generated, and then the build description gets dynamically created based on the information available in Jenkins. Um, so we know there are... So if there's a lot of these things happening simultaneously by a lot of people, I should have Exactly. So it, the, the display name of your OpenShift project is the repository that this environment corresponds to, the PR number, and then the build number. Um, so you need to be careful with your OpenShift configurations to make sure you're doing things like pod requests and limits for memory allocation and setting your kubelet arguments to make sure that you're not just having run away, you know, a thousand ephemeral environments without proper configuration that will crash your cluster. Um, but that just goes back into how do you maintain a production cluster. So one other thing, when the pull request was completed, did it automatically close down that request? So it's not even the pull request. Uh, I can show you the uh, pipeline for it. I don't want to give away too much of our 3 o'clock talk. Um, but there, this is the Jenkins file that's being used for every single repository within a GitHub organization. So if we look at the actual repository that Ray was working with, there's no Jenkins file definition in here. That's been abstracted out to an organizational layer, uh, level. And then within this environment, we've got a ephemeral block. So we say ephemeral, you tell us which environment are you mocking. You know, every organization is going to have different release frequencies. So you might not want to pull a copy of production. Maybe you want to create an ephemeral environment based on what's currently in staging or currently in test. So you say ephemeral, you tell it which environment you're mocking, and then you give it a closure, and that closure defines what am I going to do against this ephemeral environment. Uh, we pull an environment variable. We figure out what the URL for this uh, ephemeral environment is going to be. We populate an environment variable, and then all of these different test methods look for that before looking for a, a predefined URL. Um, and then when this closure ends, it kills the environment. So that's getting a little into the weeds of how the code works, but there's some boilerplate magic that goes on behind the scenes. So before it executes all these tests, it creates the environment. If these tests fail or if they finish successfully, it kills the environment after the closure. Cool. Any questions? Yeah, so I think that ephemeral environments is a technique that gets used in tandem with all of your other best practices for software development. So for things that either can't be containerized or that'd be really hard to containerize, you still would use something like mocks, right? So you still have the option of deploying a Nginx that serves you know, static JSON as a mock or using wire, like wire mock or whatever the tools are out there. So it's not Ephemeral environments is definitely not a silver bullet. It's a tool in your toolbox to help you fight the problem of tightly coupled microservice development. Um, so you, in some cases, you're still going to be required to create mocks for services. Sure. Uh, let's see. So if we go back to the blue ocean view, and we're going to dive into this in much deeper detail around the DevSecOps aspects and the different kinds of security testing later today. Um, but here we did static code analysis. We did container image scanning. We used a tool called Ally Machine for 508 compliance. We used a tool called OWASP Zap for penetration testing. Um, and later today, we'll talk about how each of these tools is swappable. Um, you're able to use different tools potentially for different teams within your organization. And I'll dive into the test reports and what this all looks like. 
later today at three. I don't want you guys to have to sit through the same, the same thing twice in a row. Hey. It is not, it is not currently on public GitHub. Uh, right now it's a consulting service through Booz Allen. We're working to figure out what the model is going to be for this. I guess this is more a question on how you're using the platform. Um, so are you using these ephemeral environments to do any of your load tests? So this would not be for load testing unless you wanted to do a very expensive implementation of it. So I guess what I'm getting at is how are you handling like node scanning? So it, so the, the purpose of the ephemeral environment in, in this implementation of it is to do the integration testing and the functional testing. Uh, if you wanted, you could also stand up horizontal pod autoscalers and set up your actual production environment. Um, but from a cost perspective, that might not be the most effective way to do it. Um, so I would not load test against an ephemeral environment unless you want to commit to having n number of ephemeral environment all scaled to your production level scaling, which I probably would not recommend from a cost perspective. But this does, so right, so you've, you're going to have an ephemeral, your realistic pipeline is probably going to be a ephemeral environment to do integration testing between the dependencies in my microservice ecosystem, deployment to a staging environment where I can, you know, hit it with load testing that's scaled the same as production, and then finally deploy to prod. Uh, depending on how advanced you want to go in your deployment schemes, you can do things like, uh, you know, A-B testing in Canary, so deploy small versions and use something like Istio or Routes to do a, uh, weight based routing to your different versions of your services. Um, so that could be two talks in and of itself to talk about what options are there. We've got two minutes. So if I have like a hotfix route or something like that, is there a way to just avoid the environment? Or does it also kill that it doesn't make sense? I would ask you why you want to deploy straight to production without testing it. Uh, I would still use a hot, so like if you had a situation where your ephemeral environment was usually based on staging and then you wanted to do a hot fix to production, you would have a fancier Jenkins file definition. Uh, and again, I want to steal the thunder from later, but this uh, routing based on what's happening in your pipeline is based on regular expressions in this case of branch and naming conventions. So you could have a different one that says on pull request from hot fix to master and then that could say ephemeral prod instead of ephemeral staging. Right? So here you've got the flexibility to define your flow and whatever makes sense for your organization. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for listening.